presenters and look forward to getting getting questions from all of you in, in, in thinking about supporting faculty and how you go to online teaching. We thought we would go to the people who wrote the books. So without further ado, let's do a quick, quick introduction of uh, the, the two folks that we have here today. Let me start with uh, Shannon, who's executive director at eCampus at uh, Oregon State University. And uh, she directly oversees uh, course development, uh, research unit, and, and open educational resources, all things that uh, they share out broadly and you need to go look and see what they're, what they're doing out there. Uh, in other roles, since uh, her arrival there in 2011 at, at, in, at Oregon State, she's been an instructional designer. Uh, she's worked on eCampus course development and training unit and has served on the faculty faculty senate. So that gives a variety of uh, uh, background there. Uh, Shannon regularly presents at conferences and has uh, written uh, several publications on course development, faculty development, and leadership and innovation. Uh, and currently, she serves on the Quality Matters Instructional Design Association uh, leadership team. And we're very excited that she's on the WCT steering committee as well. And so I have her there. And then uh, we'll talk a bit about her book in just just a moment, which I've actually re I've read I've read her book very good. And then uh, Shannon, would you like to say hello? Let's see. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm I'm thrilled to be here. Great. And let's go to to, to Tony Bates. And uh, uh, Tony has a rich background that he uh, was a founding staff member at the British Open University, uh, and then he uh, came and works at worked at the Open Learning Agency in British Columbia. Uh, Director of Distance Ed and Technology at the University of British Columbia, and uh, was uh, chair, uh, part-time chair of research and e-learning at the Open University of Catalonia, and I had other engagements all over the world in Germany and Portugal and Mexico and Chile, and uh, since 2003, he's had his own uh, consulting company, Tony Bates Associates, uh, and he's consulted all over the world on uh, distance education, e-learning, digital learning, uh, uh, sorts of issues. And I had the great uh, pleasure with working with Tony in creating the first survey of uh, post-secondary digital learning in Canada, which resulted in the creation of the uh, Canadian Digital Learning Research Association. I think I think Tony is still on the board, board for that, and it was fun to get that out there. And uh, if you go to his uh, website, his full CV comes with a warning uh, that it's 60 pages long. Uh, so you can look forward to that. And he's the author of uh, Teaching in a, in a Digital Age. Tony, well, welcome to you. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great uh, uh, honor to be talking to WCT and all, of, all the great people connected with it. Great, great. And so we're going to do just a, uh, a quick overview of the, of the two books that we, that we have here. And then uh, uh, Shannon, the Thrive Online book is, uh, uh, I did read it earlier this year, Shannon, and so it's, uh, uh, I, I think it'd be great for, I thought it came out at uh, the right time in terms of uh, uh, helping with uh, those getting into the remote teaching in terms of, you know, here are some of the, uh, some of the basics that they needed to find out about it. And it was a very, a very quick read. Uh, would you like to say more about it? Sure. Um, yeah, it certainly wasn't intended to support um, higher, you know, folks in higher ed during a, a pandemic, but I'm, I'm glad that it's, um, it, I'm glad that it's working out that way. Um, but there's, um, you know, I, on the screen here, I think you've, you've selected a pretty good uh, focal, focal point, those three forms of interaction, which I'm hoping to talk a little bit more about um, during our panel discussion today. I think that's really the heart of um, how to do online education well. Great, and let's go to uh, Tony's book. And Tony decided to create a, uh, um, in, in, in open, sort of textbook, if you will, open uh, book and teaching in a digital digital age. And uh, sorry to say, I haven't read all of your book, but I was reading parts of it as you were coming out with it because you were uh, following that whole process very neatly on your uh, uh, on your blog. And so I was uh, picking up pieces as you were going going through that. But I, I uh, when people were asking for references uh, it, as the COVID was hitting, I kept saying, well, here's Here's a free, wonderful reference. Would you like to say a bit more about uh, your, your book, Tony? Yes, I, I wrote it as a resource for faculty and instructors, uh, rather than as a, a book to be read, read from beginning to end, which is just as well, because it's something like 
600 pages long now um, as I've added more and more resources. So, um, but yes, the main aim was for this to be as easily accessible as possible. Um, so people can just, if they're interested in any particular topic, they can just go to the book and look that up and use it as they wish. So it's been translated into 10 languages now and downloaded over half a million times. So there must be something good about it. <laughs> I, th I think there is. I think. Unless it's Russ downloading the uh, copies every minute of the day, 500,000 <laughs> times. That's right. And then I print them and give them to people. Oh, no, I guess I better. Uh, <laughs> Won't do that. It, it, it's a wonderful resource. So uh, again, before we get to the first first question, just want to remind you that you know please do put uh, uh, questions into the uh, either into the Q and A or into the chat box, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna go through some preset questions that we have, but we will get we'll get to your questions. And so uh, let's go ahead and and get to our first question then. And for uh, for this one, that that quality and uh, uh, digital learning, online learning, remote learning, uh, whatever you call it, is, is really a big, big issue. But we we sort of understand that not all of these are created equally, and some of them became. It, we got into this emergency uh, remote mode at this point, and uh, uh, trying to judge quality off off of that. And so, uh, as we're looking at quality, and I picked this picture on purpose because you, uh, I wanted to ask about you know what metrics that you, that you use, but because it, it's important that you have. Uh, the right measuring tools in order to measure the right thing here. And so, but uh, Shannon, how about if you start with the, what quality indicators and metrics do you find that are useful uh, in looking at digital online learning? Sure. Uh, you know, I think the first thing that's important to note is that when we talk about quality in online or digital education, um, you know, quality doesn't spring forward from a modality, you know, quality is really pervasive across any modality that, that you're teaching in. Um, and there are varying degrees of quality in, in, um, in online courses in hybrid courses and high flex and remote emergency remote, and even in on campus. Um, so I think a common early mistake that, that some folks make is to assume that on campus is good quality and online maybe not as good. Um, I, I, I would just question that assumption to begin with and, and say that, you know, there are things we can do to ensure a quality education, regardless of the, of the modality. You know, and now that we're in 2020, um, the year is, is the gift that keeps on giving this year. Um, uh, but I would say that we, we should also be careful not to equate um, traditional online education and I love that we can now say traditional online education instead of <laughs> uh, having that be the, the new kid on the block. Um, but I think we should be careful not to equate uh, you know, traditional online education with emergency remote instruction. Um, I, you know, there's a, a lot more going on right now than, um, that are impacting teaching and learning than, than design and facilitation and, and pedagogy. Um, but it, but in general, if I'm if I'm looking about if I'm if I'm thinking about the quality of online courses, I would look for a few different things. Um, first would be that faculty training and support are present in me, in a meaningful way. Um, next, that the the design of the the online experience and the facilitation are handled differently or separately um, with with online education or face traditional face to face education. We often kind of handle the design and the facilitation at the same time. But for online education, it's really important that those be handled separately because the, the design, um, you know, if you were to try to design a course and teach it at the same time online, you would quickly be, be underwater. But finally, I think most importantly, I would say that um, looking for uh, an architecture of engagement to be uh, present, um, clear to everyone involved and, and utilized throughout the online uh, learning experience. That's that's probably the most important thing. And, and the way I like to think about that is if you think of um, traditional classroom-based instruction, the architecture of the room, um, the fact that we're meeting at a, at a given particular time really tells us a lot about how we're going to interact without us even thinking about it. So if we walk into a big lecture hall and we sit down with 500 other students, we at a certain time, we know how long we're going to be there, how we're expected to engage, 
you know, if we walk into more of a seminar style class where the tables are kind of grouped together, then I know as a student, I'm probably going to have to talk more with my, with my classmates. I'm going to be participating more. If I walk into a, a classroom with a lab bench, I know I'm going to be very hands-on. When we're online in a classroom, that space and time is wide open. And so we have to create an architecture and really be, um, be clear with our students and ourselves about how we plan to engage in that space and what the plan for interaction is going to be. So I'll give Tony a turn to, to jump in here now. Well, I, I would just say that um, I think Shannon was a little modest in not mentioning Quality Matters, which for me is the Bible on quality assurance in online mm -hmm. learning. Just look up Quality Matters if you haven't seen it already. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'd also make a distinction between what I would call uh, input, uh, measuring the quality of the input to the design, and also measuring the quality of the output. Um, most quality assurance methods are basically a list of things for instructors to do to make sure that the course is of high quality. For instance, a simple one is uh, clear learning objectives and so on. Um, but also, uh, I have a slightly different definition in my book, which is um, teaching and learning that results in the knowledge and skills that students will need in a digital age. In other words, that's more output focused. And, and, and I do that because uh, quality um, standards are based on past best practice. But as we see in COVID-19, online learning is developing and changing. And so there has to be some innovation as well as looking backwards. Mm -hmm. And so there must be some scope for trying things and doing things differently so long as you evaluate them, as well as looking at best, past best practice. And that's really important when you look at how new technologies come in and how they might change the kind of learning outcomes you, you, you can get. So I, I, I think you have to look at both uh, the necessary steps we know will lead to good quality online learning, but also be open to innovation and, and doing some things somewhat differently from the past. I'm sure. really glad you brought up Quality Matters. Um, yeah, that, that is, that is the, the quality system I'm most familiar with and have used it for, for a long time. And it's um, really important and, and using those, those standards can really help you get to those three forms of interaction and, and that, that architecture of engagement in, in online classes. It just quickly before we move on, I mean, yeah, I'm glad you brought up Quality Matters. And, and uh, uh, one thing I wonder about uh, is the remote versus online sort of distinction where we think of uh, remote as what happened in the spring where it was uh, emergency jumping in the lifeboats and versus uh, uh, just the planned distance education. And we see a lot of uh, articles recently that are uh, saying, oh, we see from the spring that that uh, online learning has failed. And I was wondering, that's a, that's a quality judgment. I was curious if either of you would like to, to comment on that part. Yeah, I think, um, I, I don't think I would agree that it, that it failed. I, I think we, we, are, we still were tending to our students. Um, I think things are definitely different because of just the extreme, um, you know, just because of the pandemic. You know, I, I think it's really important to, separate the educational experience from, you know, the chaos that, that we're all, that we're all dealing with, or at least to acknowledge, acknowledge that. Um, yeah, but I, I think one of the things to, it's important to keep in mind when we're talking about remote or online courses is, is the question of whether the instruction is synchronous or asynchronous. And I think that's something that gets glossed over sometimes with this, mm -hmm. this remote instruction, but it is a really important distinction um, and, and should really influence uh, how you're designing and facilitating your instruction. Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly impressed with what faculty and instructors did in a very, very short time across the whole of North America. Um, was it good? No, some of it wasn't, but uh, the, the, um, it, it allowed the teaching to continue. It allowed the semester to be completed. Now, if we have the same kind of poor quality in September, that's a different matter. We've had some time now to prepare people better for the September. Uh, it's not that we didn't know what to tell people in, 
in the spring about how to do good online courses. It was just impossible for often uh, departments, uh, support departments that were used to accommodating less than 10% of the faculty to suddenly ramp that up to 100% in two weeks. It was impossible. But there is more time now, or has been more time. So I hope in September we'll be seeing better quality um, emote, uh, em remote emergency learning. So um, it, it's a question of the timing. It was just impossible to do it, do quality very quickly. Uh, you just, as somebody, as I said, you had to get them in the lifeboats first. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. You're, you're giving a good transition to the to the next question that we have, and and I do see uh, what you have said have sparked some really good questions in the Q and A, and I'm not ignoring them. We'll get into them, but they're they're wondering about about interaction, and so we'll get to those in a, in a little bit. But you you talked Tony about going from the uh, spring to the fall, and we started seeing all people getting very innovative in terms of we talked about remote as being uh, you know what happened in the in the spring, and we're seeing uh, blended courses where uh, part of it is online and part of it's face-to-face -face. and then this high flux idea where you put people in cohorts and then maybe they come back or high flux originally was that it was up to the student but I don't I'm not sure that there's many doing that about whether they were face-to-face -face or whether they were um, on campus and so we're seeing all all sorts of uh, evolving versions of this I was curious if you would uh, uh, Tony maybe we'll start with you uh, about your reflections on what you're seeing in terms of these different variations for the fall? Well, before COVID-19, we were already seeing uh, a, a mix occurring of online and face-to-face -face teaching. We used to have two separate worlds. One was uh, fully face-to-face -face on campus. You'd come on campus, you'd have lectures, you'd be in a classroom, and then you did distance learning, online, fully online learning. But that's breaking down now, and it will break down even more as a result of COVID-19 because faculty will realize that students can do a lot of good work online, even though they're coming to class every day. So the question then becomes, what's the best way to mix online and face-to-face? -face? It's not a question that one is better than the other. They each have a role to play in a student's learning. Um, and so I, I reinforce Shannon's comment about asynchronous. The real strength of online learning is that it's asynchronous and we know from research that goes way back to uh, the, the introduction of audio and video cassettes that when students can access uh, even lectures online um, whenever I, they want and for as long as they want to spend studying their learning improves. So it, it's a question of time on task with asynchronous. It allows students to work um, whenever they can, um, but you have to design around that. You, you have to design for the asynch asynchronicity. Um, and that means a different, actually you can do both lectures synchronously and asynchronously. So it, it's not so much about asynchronous and, and synchronous, it's about deciding in a face-to-face -face situation, what are the real benefits of uh, students being on campus that they can't get by going online because to be honest for most students online learning is more convenient than coming to class because they can access it and fit it around if they've got part-time jobs and so on so i think the focus has always been oh we can't do this online and we keep finding that we can so the onus is now going to have to shift to looking at the affordances of face-to-face -face teaching so that we use that time on campus to best advantage great Shannon. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, we, we know quite a bit about blended or hybrid learning. We've been doing that for quite a long time. And I think um, one, of the, uh, one of the pitfalls or, or that, that can happen when someone is new to, to blended or hybrid learning is that they can design more than a course. And, and in our trainings, we've, we've called it often a, the course and a half syndrome, where you're designing for online and you're designing for the face-to-face -face portion. And it's and it's it's easy to duplicate efforts, and it, it can sometimes feel like two different courses from the student point of view. Uh, but also, just from a general workload perspective, it, you can, you know, you don't want to get rid of all the the great things you do face to face, and you want to do a lot of great things online. Well, you you know, you can't run two separate courses as one as one course. 
And as we shift more toward high flex, where we have just even more combinations here, it seems like there's a risk of maybe a two and a half course <laughs> syndrome that, that could happen. Um, so I think it's, it's really important in, from a design perspective to go back to the learning outcomes and just really get back to basics and say, um, you know, do some alignment work as, you know, um, like what QM uh, would recommend, for instance, uh, where you start with your learning outcomes and then you think, and you work with backwards design and you think, okay, how am I going to assess those um, given that we have these different uh, modalities that we're interacting in? And then what are the um, learning activities that need to be conducted in order to get ready for those assessments and what kind of materials do we, do we need? Um, and, and then being really conscious about, you know, uh, allotting some of those to the, to the different modalities that you're going to be including in your course, you know, regardless of any of these, um, uh, this assortment that we have here. But another important piece of that is making sure that those, um, those different modalities are talking to each other <laughs> um, or, you know, so that if what you're doing in the online space um, is actually woven together with what you're doing in the either um, face-to-face or in the remote synchronous space, that, that those things are connected in a, in a clear way. Okay. Yeah. And I think there are, you know, some worries about, you said mentioned the course and a half with the high flex. And I think there are some worries about, uh, you know, it's hard to teach well face-to-face. -face. It's hard to teach well in online. And then some of the high flex models have you trying to do both, both at once. And then before we move on, any, any comments about that? Yeah. Well, I, I think it's really important that um, you, when you're looking at a, a blended course, you have to replace something if you're adding online component and that face, it has to come out of the face to face. So if you're offering three lectures a week, um, face to face, and then you want to go to a blended mode, well, the question is, uh, are there better ways for the students to achieve the same learning outcomes without them having to have lectures, for instance? And there's two reasons for this. The, the main one is not to overload the students, but it's also not to overload you as a faculty member. And if you look at the implementation of any technology in any work, um, it replaces previous activities of some kind with other activities. So I, I think you have to look very carefully at both your workload as an instructor, but particularly the student workload. And I don't think the Carnegie system helps us very much here because, you know, the, the idea of uh, hours of contact don't make any sense once you get into a blended or online mode. Mm -hmm. but what you have to look at is the overall amount of time you would expect a student to spend studying on a course and make sure that uh, when you divide up the face-to-face -face and online time, it doesn't exceed that, that number. Good, 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 good. Well, and, and uh, before we move on, I know and was hearing from our friends at uh, University of Central Florida this week about that their, their research continues to show that you know, good, well-designed, blended courses tend to uh, have better outcomes in terms of either fully online or fully, mm -hmm. uh, either fully online or fully face-to-face. -face. And so we'll be, they're going into sort of a blend flex mode. I'll be curious to see what the research shows from that. So mm -hmm. with that, let's move to our, our, our next question. We we're talking about, uh, again, about different, uh, different modalities and what we're doing and that, that you know, for uh, whether it's uh, courses within a profession or uh, say medical technologies or any of the medical areas or some very practical courses or, or, or even in, in, the, in the arts, performing arts and some of these things that it's, it's uh, uh, tough with people not being able to, uh, to get together. And so, you know, have you seen some uh, good examples in terms of uh, people doing a good job of moving these things online or, uh, or doing some sort of blended, uh, blended version of these? It's interesting, you know, in all the years that I've worked in, in higher education and, and online education in particular, I, I think every, I think I've had, a, you know, conversations with someone from every discipline who, who says something like, well, I'm sure that online can be done well, but not in, not in my discipline, you know, not, and whether that is um, science because of labs or, 
if it's more of a humanities course because we want that discussion face to face and that's so much part of it or it's a writing course where we need to be workshopping I mean, everyone's got reasons for um, when they're new to online education that um, they're not sure it's going to, to work for them and um, that's kind of funny uh, to, to hear that from coming from so many different perspectives um, but it's also I think it's a, where it comes from is a, is a good place that the people are concerned about quality and they want to make sure that their students are having a good learning experience. Um, and so I think that's, it's important to acknowledge that when we're having, having those conversations. Um, you know, I think that there are, there's very little that we can't teach online right now. I think we're more and more we can, we can teach online. There are certainly some things that we, are not able to teach online that I don't know that we'll ever be able to. And I'm, I'm thinking of things like chemistry labs where there are dangerous chemicals that need ventilation and special equipment that no one could have in, in, their, in their houses um, or you know, individual, on an individual kind of personalized basis. Um, but I, I do think that there are, even, even in a difficult, um, really highly technical or even like a dangerous component <laughs> kind of lab like that. I think there are pieces of that that we can do that we can do online. We can we can simulate, um, but it, it really depends on the the resources that you have available. But I've seen labs done um, in a variety of courses and, and labs and field work. I would I would kind of group together. Um, I mean anything from like your kitchen kitchen labs with you know household kinds of items that students are are working with um, to lab kits that they may purchase like a like a textbook um, that they that they can work with in their in their homes um, or virtual or simulated or just things out in the field that they can go uh, go and do um, you know the the trick there I think is to get back to those learning outcomes and do an outcomes based design rather than trying to replicate, this is what we do in the lab situation on campus, how am I gonna do that exact same thing online? You've really gotta go back to the, the foundation and say, what are the learning outcomes? And the way that my students are going to learn them may not look exactly the way that they do in a traditional campus-based lab setting, but I can still help them meet those learning outcomes in, in other ways. So I think getting back to those outcomes is really the key to coming up with a, um, a design that, that will work. You must have been an instructional designer focused on the outcomes. <laughs> I, I was, yeah, it's, it's in my blood. <laughs> yeah, very good, very good. Tony? I'd, I'd like to go back to the history of science teaching. Uh, uh, Thomas Huxley was a uh, professor, uh, I can't remember whether it was Oxford or Cambridge, and he wanted to teach science, uh, and he wanted to teach it um, in a practical way, uh, which he couldn't do at Oxford. He actually left and set up what is now Imperial College. And he invented the lab method of teaching science, mm -hmm. right? So this is an invented construct. It's been an extremely good one. It served us so well for 150 or, or more years. But the important thing is here, what, what he was trying to teach was experimental and scientific methodology. Now, it, that's the, that was the learning outcome, not so much, oh, this is, if you mix chemical X with chemical Y, look what happens. Yes, sure, but it, it was the chemical, it was the scientific method of doing research that he was trying to teach. Mm -hmm. Now, if we step back and look at that as the primary outcome of STEM teaching, then a number of things we should take into account. First of all, a lot of STEM now is digitalized. For instance, uh, if you look at the Mar uh, Mars rover, it's all remote, it's all digital. Uh, I noticed that uh, Ru uh, Russ had put down um, welding, uh, welding, very hands-on vocational skill. But what welders do these days, certainly if they're working with pipelines, is they send a robot down the pipeline. They don't do the welding themselves, the robot does it. They spend all their time looking at a computer screen and manipulating the computer screen. Now, it's true, they know how to do welding physically, but they are actually digitally learning also how to control the, um, control the robot. So it's very important to think, of, as Shannon says, about the outcomes and are there other ways of getting there if you can't get into a physical lab? Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, I want to be very clear that at the moment we don't have enough alternatives to physical labs. 
uh, digitally. They're, they're coming, they're being built slowly, but there are two things here. One, they cost a lot of money to build a good simulation. And secondly, um, we, it has to be adaptable so that a, an individual instructor can take that simulation and play with it so that it fits the way they want to teach. So you can't just have a rigid, uh, non-adaptable simulation. You've got to have one. Now that means very high quality. It's like developing a video game. You have to put a lot of effort into it. So rather than every individual faculty member trying to create their own simulations, what we need are some really good national simulations in things say that are taught in, uh, taught in first and second year courses, more or less universally, that are open educational resources that can be downloaded and shared by, by, by faculty who have to teach online for whatever reason, and they can use these simulations. Mm -hmm. And we're not there yet. Um, but I see it coming. Colleges and Institutes Canada is talking to the federal government about a $20 million project that would allow um, high quality simulations in core college subjects to be developed nationally that could be shared across all the colleges. Um, but that, that costs money to do and we're not there yet. Great. We agree 100% and you know other challenges that are um, related to that is that you know you develop it once but then you also need to redevelop it and keep it keep it updated and and change it so every so often because you know you're having different student groups come through and so even just from an academic integrity standpoint you you want to keep that fresh and and and, and changing that but another challenge um, is with accessibility and the, the the more complex the design gets like if we're using virtual reality or something I, I don't think we've really figured out yet how to make those um, kind of new and emerging uh, environments truly accessible. And I'm going to keep moving us along and, and uh, Shannon, you got some thumbs up on your comment about uh, some people say, saying that uh, uh, they think their, their programs can't be done online. And so, but we've certainly seen quality faculty figure thing, things out, you know, and rent their uh, For the next question that we have here, uh, this is something that really, really hit us in the face with the COVID, you know, that we've got, we're trying to get faculty up, up to speed who really uh, maybe have had very little uh, use or have done just a little bit with digital in the face-to-face uh, uh, -face classroom or they're new to teaching, you know, what can we do to prepare, prepare these folks so that, uh, uh, as Tony said, that we uh, better do better in the fall than we did in the spring. What should we be doing to, to make that better? Yeah, I think, you know, it, it's funny when, when faculty are, you know, first, you know, immersed in this, okay, I'm going to do online or remote education, I think their minds first go to, how am I going to deliver my content? And so it gets to things like lecture capture and which technology am I going to use and how do I learn to use the learning management system or Zoom or what, you know, whatever the tools are that, that they're going to use and that can take up all of your time if you let it. <laughs> um, and, and it's important, but it's important also not to stop there um, because it, a, an online course or a remote course isn't just the canned recorded content. It's a living, breathing thing and it's human interaction that happens all the way through. And so you really need to, um, you know, once you figure out how you're going to do your content delivery, you really have to think about that architecture of engagement and, and think about um, how are, how are those three forms of interaction, that student content interaction, student student interaction and student instructor interaction going to happen? And how are they going to happen on a regular basis throughout the, the, the term of study? Um, and there are so many different ways to meet each of those, um, each of those standards or, or, or goals. Um, but, but you really have to be intentional about it and, and think about what makes sense for your course, the level, the subject matter, the number of students that you have, whether you're using synchronous or asynchronous components or both, um, and, and where those are all, all those are going to be. But if you are looking, that's you know, beyond the, the content delivery, a faculty should be asking themselves, how are, my, how are my students going to accomplish those three forms of interaction? Um, and, and how are they gonna do that throughout, on a regular basis throughout the, throughout the term? Tony? Yeah. Yes. Um, I guess the reason I wrote my book was that I felt that 
uh, in a digital age, we need to rethink our primary teaching model in post-secondary education, which is primarily focused on content delivery, not, not exclusively, but uh, if, you look at the, if you look at the amount of time that students spend studying, it's primarily on learning content. And frankly, the content is all out there now anyway. Uh, I like to tell the story of my grandson who was doing a traditional physics course in Britain and I come home and find him uh, online. And I said, as your professor put your teaching online, he says, no, he's just a terrible professor. I can't, we can't understand these lectures. We know what the topics are, but what he, the actual details, which are really important in physics, we don't understand. So we go online and look up the topics. And he was actually looking at MIT open courseware lectures, because they're much better than his lecture. The content is all out there now. And you're competing as an instructor with some really brilliant instructors who've put their stuff online and it's probably better than what you can do in that subject area. may not be your spin on it, but certainly in first and second years, it's not going to be a great deal different in content. It's the presentation that matters. Now, what, what we really need though and what employers are needing and what students are needing are skills that will allow them to live in a digital age. And those skills are high level intellectual skills like critical thinking, communication skills and so on. So we need to focus a lot more on teaching skills. Now, my answer to the first question is really, you need to rethink your teaching. And again, it's probably not time to between, do that between now and the fall. But why I say rethink your teaching is that if we look at the classroom, uh, model that that's an industrial model it was set up in industrial times and it's worked very well everybody comes to school or to college uh, they work nine to five they go home etc when you go online you're in a different learning environment and again it has its limitations and restrictions but it also has its benefits and you've got to design for those benefits and so what I say to faculty who are going online for the first time, this is a wonderful opportunity to step back and think about how you'd really like to teach. And can you teach in the way you'd really like to teach? Would you, what would you like students to be doing on this course? And how can you best then combine the, the online and face-to-face -face teaching to allow students to do that? Because in the end, it's the students who have to do the learning. You think of a lecture, we, the faculty do all the work. They decide what has to be taught. They fi find the sources, they uh, build an argument, uh, they, they present it to students. Well, students can do that now. All the content is out there online. Most of it's free and accessible. What we need to teach them is what's good content, how do you evaluate that, how do you apply that in your work and so on. So, Fundamentally, it's not about technology. It's not even about online and distance learning. It's about preparing the students who will survive in a very tough world um, where there are not a lot of permanent jobs, where people are moving from job to job and they have to have what's called transversal skills that they can use if they move from employer to employer, for instance. And so, so this is a wonderful opportunity for you to think very carefully about the needs of the students and how you could design your courses to meet those needs without being restricted to students coming three times a week to a lecture. Okay, I'm going to move us to our, our last question and just ask you, uh, uh, given the time, and we do have some good questions that have, that have come in, uh, just asking you, what's one recommendation that you would give uh, to our academic leaders for, this, for the coming year? I would say this is the time to look to your experienced online educators um, and, and look to them for guidance. They have figured out a lot of the, the questions and the innovations that are that are needed to teach remotely well. Um, so I would, uh, I think this is a really exciting time to be in online education because for so long we've been like this kind of side um, experiment or, or project, but it's really, um, it's becoming more mainstream now. Um, and, and I think this COVID-19 situation has given us really um, the opportunity to, to lead and to really help our campuses get through uh, the, just these difficult times. Okay. Tony. I, I would suggest that every institution needs a digital learning strategy or a plan. Um, and 
not so much at the institutional level, but at the departmental level, because it will be it will differ from academic discipline to academic mm -hmm. discipline. But really, you should be thinking, where do we want to be in five years time with our teaching? How do we want to be teaching in five years time, knowing what we now know about online and distance learning, uh, virtual reality and some of the other technologies that are coming in? And in particular, what kind of outcomes do we want from our teaching in five years time? What should our students be able to do? And how can digital learning help us get there? And then what are the resources we need to do that? How do we prepare faculty? Uh, do we need extra money for this? Uh, and if so, where are we gonna find that money from? So I, I think every institution needs a digital learning strategy, hopefully devolved down to the individual department, departmental level. Good, good. Yeah, I, I agree with that. That's a really, really great point. Well, let's get, get to some questions that, that we have, have here. And uh, one goes back to quality matters. Important to note, uh, quality matters addresses design uh, only, not facilitation, uh, which is also important and uh, distinct, as Shannon mentioned. Uh, so quality matters helps with design, but faculty need advice on facilitation best practices too. What would, you, what would you recommend about going beyond uh, quality matters and, and uh, getting into the facilitation? How would you help faculty or what other rubrics would you use? Yeah, I think um, that it's a difficult question and I, there's not one resource that I would, I would point to necessarily. Um, but, I, but I think that the, the design and facilitation, they are separate and they're, they're separate phases, but they also are very deeply connected. So how you design your course should uh, influence how you, how you live in it and how you move in that space and, and what you do in that, in that, in that space. So um, that, you know, the, the design and, and, and how you communicate that to students, your, your design should communicate to you as the, as the faculty member and to your students exactly how that engagement is, is supposed to happen and, and how long. Um, and how often and, and all of that, but also the faculty member needs to be active in the in the course. Um, I think there's a little bit of a misconception, at least with some of the, the new to online faculty that I've met over the years, where um, they think that they are kind of like making a recording and then that recording is going to stand up and, and be the, the teaching and, and, and do that, but that's really not how it, how it works. There's a big design phase that you do with, with online education, but then there's also a heavy amount of facilitation and interaction that you need to have with with students. There, there's a lot of published 10 or 15 years ago now about facilitating online uh, collaboration amongst students. Uh, the books by Jilly Salmon and there are some in, in, in I can't remember the names now they were so long on so long ago. So this isn't rocket science. We've had best practices in this area for a long while. Um, but you're right, they tended to be separate from the design and production of a course. Mm -hmm. uh, I, in my, my book, I have nine steps to quality learning, and one of them is communicate, communicate, communicate. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of research done in Canada, actually, on the importance of instructor presence and uh, also uh, student presence in online discussions and so on, and how do we increase instructor presence, which is critical for student success, um, and how to... Uh, enable students to uh, negotiate and discuss and what kind of rules there should be in place for encouraging quality discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, I recommend Linda Harrison's book on this on online collaborative learning. So there is lots of, lots of literature out there. It's just that it's maybe 10, 10 15 years old now and people have forgotten all about it. <laughs> yes, we can still learn from a few things from 10 years ago, not, not everything. But. Well, there's a question about, uh, we talked about uh, level, we talked about the types of interaction, uh, but what about levels of interaction? Is there a way to measure the numbers? Uh, uh, okay. Decided to move on me. Is there a way to measure numbers and levels of interaction that leads to better online course? Or is I'm that sure necessary? There, I'm sure there are, um, and it could be, <laughs> just my background and, you know, um, I come out of, uh, you know, English studies. And so I'm more of a, a qualitative person than a quantitative, I think. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure there are ways to do it quantitatively, but um, 
I think a lot of that is just the lived experience of the faculty member and the engagement and the students and it's um, it, it's more qualitative by nature. Um, one example I would give, you know, and I, I sometimes I think that imposing something quantitative on, on something that's so dynamic and fluid as teaching and learning can, can be a little bit of a hindrance. So um, one thing that I see really often is the, the post once and reply twice model of discussions. And, you know, you think it, it, it seems like it would, you know, it, it would bear fruit, right? Because you're, you're having students interact with the content, with each other, um, and you're giving a framework, you're, you're communicating your expectations. But, um, you know, that model of that, that's been so overused and it, it really falls, up, come, falls short. It, it, it leads to shallow, repetitive discussion. Um, if we, we know how to have class discussions, we know how to do that. We just have to understand how to, um, how to bring that into that online asynchronous space, especially. Uh, and, and what that means is that the instructor needs to be present uh, um, and that students need to listen as well as talk. Uh, and we know this in a face-to-face in a -face classroom that we, we just need to kind of do a little bit of translation and, and kind of guide students on, on what that looks like. And so, yeah, they, they need to read the other posts of other students. And whether you post something or reply, it shouldn't really matter. What should matter is your level of engagement that you're interacting and that you're engaging with the, the content and each other. Uh, and so when we put those kind of artificial quantitative measures on things, I think we, we can be limiting. I think the important thing about online learning is that it's, for me as a, an instructor, I find it much more transparent about what students are actually doing in terms of studying because uh, it leaves a trace. So if you have activities for students to do, then you can see what those, not just the end result of the activity, but often the work they put in getting there. Uh, for instance, the use of e-portfolios is particularly useful for giving students project work and you can use it either as an assessment tool or uh, the student can use it as a personal way of guiding their studies because they have to complete tasks and, put, and fill them in and evaluate them and so on. So, and, and the other thing is you can do continuous assessment so you're not having to mark hundreds of papers at the end of the uh, at the end of the uh, semester, but you can assess students as they go. I usually have a column. Um, actually, I think you can do this in some learning management systems automatically now. But I used to use a spreadsheet where I had the students' names down one side, and then all the activities I'd ask them to do online, which I could see um, across the top. And then I could either just tick that they'd done it or give them a grade out of 10, say, for each activity that they did. And then I could look through that at the end of the semester and just give them a grade without having to do a final assessment. Now, I always like to have sort of 50% maybe done at the end of the course to make sure that they actually got to where I wanted them to get. But nevertheless, that reduced considerably the amount of time I was spending at the end of the semester marking papers because I had a pretty good idea of what the students were capable of before I got there. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Yeah, thanks, Tony. And, and I see that uh, we have a, a question about a reference for the Linda Harrison book. We'll get that from you and then uh, send it out with the materials afterwards and uh, get, get that out to everyone. So uh, I want people to, to know that. Uh, it, it, in, in Sam in the, um, in the chat, chat box says that, wondered, uh, well, sticking with interaction, that is there a fourth interaction of the student to self? in terms of uh, formal opportunity re for reflection. Do you, do, how, what's your reaction to that? I think that's super important. I always include that as, as with active learning, um, where you have the meaningful engagement with the, the content, but then paired with reflection. I think that's whether we count that as part of um, the student content interaction or, or the student self. However, we're going to tally that up. That's, super, super important to have in place. Great. Yeah, there, there are some tools that are very useful for that. For instance, you can use, um, at University of British Columbia, every student has a, a, a blog, which is can either be private or public. Private means that anybody in the university can see it, but nobody else, or it can be public open to anybody and student's choice. 
Um, and they can reflect in the blogs uh, on their learning and share that with other students uh, the, or the instructor if they want to, it's their choice. Um, again, e-portfolios are very good for, you can actually ask students to reflect on their own work and put that down like a diary in, in, in an e-portfolio. Um, I, I think self-reflection is very important. I know in many nursing programs, it's an essential component for nursing that, uh, that they reflect on how they've interacted with patients and whether that was successful or not. So yes, I absolutely agree. And there are formal tools in online learning that enables you and students to do that. Well, there are good questions about, about interaction, but I'm gonna move on to another topic and resist my urge to uh, rant about uh, regulations, about regulating substantive interactions, so, but we'll move on from that. Uh, but there's a, a good question here from Jennifer about is, is there an optimal, optimal number of students in an online course to maximize the quality of interactions, um, also the number and frequency of interactions, and not overload the faculty member and students? And that, that's, a, if we, that's a million dollar question if we had the answer to that, but I'd be curious to hear, hear what your response is. And so. Well, it's five more students than you think. <laughs> <laughs> Say uh, more about that. Uh, yeah, well, it's a piece of string, isn't it? I mean, it depends on, you know, what's the length of a piece of string? Uh, it depends on how you teach. Um, if you're just into content delivery, then you can have a lot larger number of students. If you're trying to develop skills, then students need a lot more feedback. Um, and so therefore the, the ratio comes down pretty dramatically. So it, it's not a question of what's the optimum number. It's the question of uh, what are your primary objectives in the course and uh, what's needed to get to those objectives in the most efficient manner. Now, I have to say that in arts and humanities subjects, I, I find that a ratio of one to 30 is about the maximum at graduate level. You can probably have a bit more at undergraduate level um, because the quality of the discussion tends to be a little higher with the graduate uh, students and therefore you have to pay more attention to it. Um, but again, you can build a lot of automatic uh, responses into student. You can have a lot of automated activities to students. So if you're teaching mathematics, you can put an enormous amount of uh, automation into setting activities for students and uh, getting them to be self-assessed or to be assessed automatically. So it, it does vary enormously from the subject area and from what you're trying to teach and what your learning outcomes are. But I have to say, when I get over 50 students in a group, uh, I find it hard, particularly in terms of what I would call instructor presence, to feel that I know all the students and I have enough way of qualitatively assessing them if I need to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add to that would be that it also depends on the number of GTAs you have. Uh, you know, if you, if you have uh, teaching assistants in your course that are helping you, you can you can increase your numbers. Um, but that's just more more on the faculty side that that are responsible for that for that engagement. But if if you want a really straightforward, simple answer, I can share um, from my from my experience, my my opinion. I used to teach writing, uh, so it was, these were discussion heavy and writing intensive courses um, at the um, freshman sophomore level mostly. And my sweet spot was 15 to 25. If I had under 15 students, it felt like it lagged a little bit. And if it was more than 25, it felt kind of overwhelming. But if I could keep it between that 15 and 25, it was, that was the sweet spot for me. Okay. Yeah, and I think people have, have uh, created some innovations where that could expand it, but that takes an investment, you know, beyond the, the normal class. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm gonna go to one, more question and ask for just a quick, uh, uh, quick response from uh, either just just one of you that you have a good question about synchronous versus asynchronous. But Shannon, I think you hit the, hit that a bit. But there's one about consistency and about the need. You know, how much is there a need uh, for consistency in the experience for online courses? You know, from from course to course, they make the point that face to face that you have a set schedule and a set way that you do things. How, how important is that to be consistent in terms of how the online courses are across an institution? I, I think it's very important. Um, what, what I tried to 
stop institutions doing is getting into, for instance, learning management system wars about which learning management system is best. It, from a student perspective, it's much better to focus on one learning management system that works across as many subject areas as possible. So they don't have to constantly learn how to uh, use the technology every time they switch courses. Um, um, or, but probably more important than technology consistency, I mean, you could say the same for synchronous technologies, incidentally. Um, you know, some faculty using Zoom, some using Blackboard Collaborate and so on. The students get fed up with that. And it's not difficult. You can manage it fairly easily, but it's just annoying and not necessary because, frankly, from a pedagogical point of view, there's not a lot of difference between different learning management systems. It's at the back end where the differences are, and your IT people are better at judging that than the, than, than the faculty are. You may not do everything the faculty member wants, but in most cases, these systems do. It's just a question that faculty often haven't learned how to use all the facilities that the system offers, for instance. So consistency, I think, is absolutely important, but probably even more important within a department, not necessarily across departments, but within a department, there should be some consistency in the pedagogy as well. Or if you decide to move away from more or less the standard pedagogy, there's very good explanations to the students about why you're doing that. Um, we know that students moving from arts to science and back again have enormous problems and that's that they're epistemological problems because uh, the understanding of what constitutes valid knowledge is different across the disciplines and that's often not explained to students. Um, so if you're in a subject like social sciences and you've got statistics on the one hand and Marxist theory on the other, then you're moving between different epistemologies and you can't standardize that, so, but you need to explain that to the students so they understand. Shannon, I see that uh, uh, Megan is giving us the hook and I wanna thank everyone for, for being on with us today. I wanna to thank both of you for your, your great insights. We did notice the, the uh, great uh, discussion about HyFlex and we're thinking about having a future uh, session on that and, and thinking about it and that we'll get back to with the, some of the resources that we have with that. Uh, thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Tony. Uh, I'll turn it to Megan. Great, and thank you, Russ. This was an excellent conversation. I know I learned a lot. So if this is your first interaction with WCT, visit our website. We have a lot of content and resources available there. And we're putting together the program for a virtual annual meeting. And I think you'll find that the topics are gonna be very, very timely and important. So check that out for more information. And again, Keep posted on our website for additional information about upcoming webcasts and links to previous webcasts. I'd like to take just a minute to thank our supporting WCET members, as well as our annual sponsors who underwrite much of our programming and event here, events here at WCET. So thank you for your questions. We will get responses back to those questions we didn't have a chance to answer live and any additional resources and links that were referenced will include those as well. Thank you all. Good luck this fall. Good job all. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you Tony. Bye. Thank you Shannon. Nice to see you Tony. Hi on about to fix the date for the follow-up. Yes, we'll circle back. All right, thank you.